Welcome, Anthem Church. It's so good to see you all this morning. My name is Mackenzie, and I have the pleasure of serving on the worship team here. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's word. Galatians 6, 1 through 10. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burden, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the spirit will from the spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have the opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are in the household of faith. This is the word of the Lord. Please remain standing for prayer. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your grace and your mercy in our life. Holy Spirit, thank you for being a conviction in our life, for helping us grow in our faith, for helping us grow in the fruit of the Spirit. Lord, I pray that today's word is convicting to each and every one of us. I pray that we open our hearts, God, to your word. I pray, Lord, that we are challenged by it. Don't, we don't just cast it aside, but we try to live out the gospel in the Spirit-filled life. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen, church. You guys can have a, uh, a seat. I'm Pastor Sergi Manchik. I happen to be one of the pastors that gets to preach and teach, um, and it's a pleasure to see you all. I want to welcome the new visitors. Thank you for joining us. Uh, if you're here for the first time, we've been going through the book of Galatians over the last couple of weeks, a uh, couple months, and we're actually coming to the close of our study of Galatians. We have one more week left before we move on to the next book, um, and I'm excited for that. Uh, but I don't know about you, I, I've, I've uh, as we've gone through Galatians, have really been challenged and blessed by the words that Paul wrote to the, uh, the Galatians, the, the Gentiles, the new believers that were found in the region of Galatia. And truly, it's made me go back and reread re a lot of uh, uh, previously read and maybe misunderstood scripture and has challenged me to uh, uh, dive deeper. And so it's been, a, it's been a wonderful time. And I don't say that just because a pastor. I truly, truly mean that. So uh, I hope you've been in that same boat. Um, but the last few uh, uh, weeks, um, in chapter 5 and today in chapter 6, we see this new thought that Paul is presenting. And, and truly, chapter 5 uh, um, is the beginning of uh, a point that Paul is making, and he continues that point into chapter 6. So chapter 6 is there as a break, but truly these two chapters are together. And what Paul has been doing is he's been describing the Christian life as a struggle. He writes that the flesh fights against the spirit, and the fear against the spirit against the flesh and it's a hard struggle it ain't easy and we are continually being pulled off the path and our way to and the only way to continue and finish our spiritual journey is to walk by the spirit in other words to live by the spirit what does it mean to live by the Spirit? Well, in Galatians 5, we learned that it means to allow Him to lead us into righteousness and to allow there to be fruit that are produced as evidence of the Spirit in us. Those fruit are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We all learned this the last couple of weeks. But see, that's not all. Paul continues his thought, and he, self, he says, not only that, we should also be helping one another along the way. We are to restore the fallen. We are to bear others' burdens. We are to share good things, encourage one another, and we are to do good to all people, but especially fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so that's Paul's teaching in a nutshell today. 
I kind of gave you the answers to the test, but I think, I think we're going to go a little deeper into what Paul is saying, and I hope that God blesses you. What today Paul is doing is actually he's answering a question that was posed in Genesis by a man named Cain. Cain, who killed his brother Abel, and when God came and asked Cain, listen, where's your brother Abel? You know what Cain responded with? He said, am I my brother's keeper? What an irresponsible, infamous, and selfish response to God. And so Paul answers that question today. He says, yes, yes, Cain, yes, dear brother and sister, you are your brother's keeper. This is what the spirit-filled and the spirit-led Christian does. He, er, he or she thinks of others and how he or she might serve them. Now, the general principle today from Paul is given in verse 2 uh, uh, when he says, bear one another's burdens. You could title the sermon with that, bear one another's burdens. But we see he begins the chapter with actually a specific example of burden bearing by giving the instruction in verse 1 to restore anyone who is caught in transgression, in other words, sin, in a spirit of gentleness. Now, Paul may have had the sin of legalism in his mind when he wrote these words because, of course, legalism has been the main concern of the book, right? We've been hearing about the Judaizer and how legalistic they are and how they've been scamming the new believers in Galatia to now not only believing in Jesus but believing that there's uh, required works to earn favor and, and earn salvation from God. And so perhaps he's speaking to the legalism aspect. But remember in, verse, or in chapter 5, he also brought up these... Uh, uh, deeds of the flesh, in other words, sins that we are guilty of falling or getting caught up, uh, caught up in. Sins of sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and that sort of thing. So he's speaking to sin in general. And the word transgression has this sense of trespass or taking a false step, a misstep. And when we don't keep in step with the Holy Spirit, when we don't keep in step with the Spirit, we tend to take false steps. We stumble, we fall beside the path, we all get got, as they say. First John tells us, listen, if you say that you're not a sinner, if you have believed that you're not a sinner, you are deceiving yourself. You're lying to yourself. We all get caught up in sin. And if we're not careful about our spiritual walk, it will very likely happen to us and very soon. And so we will be caught by sin, as Paul says, which has this idea of being surprised by sin. Now, Paul is not talking about that person who is living willfully in a reckless sort of way, right? Willfully living in sin, I don't care, I don't need God, I don't need church, I do what I do, I do what I want, YOLO, I live my life the way I want it, it's, uh, life is all about me, pleasing myself, doing what I want, I have my own truth. And the Bible speaks to that sort of person, today Paul is not addressing that guy or that gal. Today what we're looking at is someone who due to a careless walk, right, they, 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 they let the guard down, right, they're careless in the way they're pursuing God and they suddenly suddenly trip and fall into sin. And so he says, what's done to be with, with such a person? If you and I fall into sin, right, if you and I get caught up in sin, what should we do? How should we go about it? And Paul says we are to restore them. Now, in the New Testament, this uh, uh, phrase restore has this concept or this visual of mending fishing nets. In ancient medical literature, it describes setting a broken bone back into place. I don't know if you've ever had a broken bone or a dislocated joint, but, but, but there is immense, immense pain. Why? Because the, the, the bone or the joint is not aligned. And so every movement is bone on bone contact, and it is intense 10 out of 10 pain. People are writhing in pain, except they can't writhe because it causes more pain, right? They're crying. Grown men, burly men are crying tears of pain because it hurts so much when our, bo when our bones or our joints are out of alignment. 
And so what do we do? If we have insurance, we go to the hospital, right? We ask the doc, hey doc, can you pop this back in? We probably aren't talking too much because we're busy screaming in pain. And so the doctor, what he does is in a very violent and forceful way, he will pop the dislocated shoulder or knee or elbow into place. He will set your bone so that it's not grinding on itself, but it is put back where it belongs. And in that moment, even though there's torn ligaments and tendons, perhaps the bone, I mean, the bone is still broken, right? It hasn't had time to heal yet, but in the moment where that bone gets set back into place, that joint gets put back into place, there is immediate relief. Feels like you're in heaven. Somebody, an angel of God, has put this thing back into place, and I no longer am writhing in pain. And so this is the visual that Paul is painting for us when we approach someone that has been caught up in sin. This is true in the spiritual restoration. Now, it takes skill and experience to put a bone back into place. My friend Max once broke his nose. He came to my brother to set it back into place. And let's just say it wasn't a pretty sight. He got his bones reconfigured the wrong way, so he still ended up having to go to the hospital, to the doctor. And there was intense, intense pain. It takes someone with skill and experience to do this special type of medical procedure. And very similar in the spiritual sense, it takes someone with skill and experience to restore that person that has been caught up in, 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 in sin. And so Paul says rehab, spiritual rehab, must be done only by those who are spiritual. Now we're not talking about those that are spiritual, right? They got that vibe. No, what he's talking about is those that are led by the Spirit. Those that live by the Spirit. Those whose life is controlled by the Spirit and is producing what Paul has described as the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Back in chapter 5, Paul says, through love serve one another. Fruit of the Spirit. Verse 1 here, he says, restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Fruit of the Spirit. So to be qualified to restore someone, you must be led by the Spirit. That's how we restore people. We don't restore people by beating them down with their guilt and their shame and making them outcasts. We don't restore broken lives by breaking them even more. We restore them and we rehabilitate the broken with gentleness and love. Martin Luther in his commentary on Galatians says regarding this scripture, this verse, Therefore if ye see any brother cast and afflicted by occasion of sin which he hath committed, run unto him and reaching out your hand, raise him up again, comfort him with sweet words and embrace him with motherly arms. Anybody that's ever studied Luther knows that these are weird words coming out of this guy's mouth. Luther was not a mushy, gushy, lovey type guy. He didn't give out free hugs to everyone that came across him. He was an abrasive man with rough edges. And I believe that God needed, him, needed a man like him to stand up to the corrupt, to corrupt and wicked church and corrupt and wicked pope. And he did. He faced them and it led to the reformation of the church. But Luther, with all his roughness, listen how he describes when restoring a fellow brother. He says, embrace him with motherly arms. That's the way the work of restoration works, with love and gentleness. And this should characterize all of us. If we claim to be followers of Christ, that we know the Spirit lives in us, and if the Spirit lives in us, we must be producing fruit. And we should be producing the fruit of love and gentleness. To walk by the Spirit, we must, we must have this fruit and be looking to help one another in grace and in truth. He goes on to say, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, burdens are a reality in a fallen world. It's a reality of life. Paul knows that the, the Galatians will have burdens. Perhaps he's already seen them. Paul knows that he'll have burdens. Paul knows that you and I will come across burdens in life. It's a reality of life. And they may come in the form of mental illness, physical illness, financial crisis. It may come in the form of depression, demonic op oppression, addiction, family crisis. One thing is for sure, no one escapes feeling the weight of such problems. Jesus himself said in John chapter 16, in this world you will have trouble. So we are not self-sufficient and we all need help. 
Paul know, not only knows this, uh, that we will carry burdens, but that we cannot help ourselves. We cannot carry all our b- burdens. And so, yes, as the Bible says, we should first cast our burdens on God, knowing that he will sustain us. The psalmist says in chapter 55, verse 12, and yes, Jesus did take the ultimate burden when he died in our place. But we are also instructed to share our trials and struggles with other fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And sometimes the answer to your prayer is found in the help of a fellow believer. Even the best servants of God needed help. We look at two examples. Moses, right? The great man Moses stood up to Pharaoh, took the Israelites out of exile. And in Numbers 11, even he reached the end of his rope. He said, I'm not able to carry all this people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. Paul, the great Paul, said that he was weary and afflicted, but the Lord used Titus to help him. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 6, but God who comforts the downcast comforted us by, uh, by the coming of Titus. Even the great Paul needed Titus. We all need a Titus at moments in our life. We all will have burdens that just overwhelm us, and we need help. But in the same sense, we also need to be the Titus for others in our life, to our fellow brothers and sisters. And so burden bearing is not just one way street, it's a, it's a, it's a two way street. Not only do we share our burdens, but we also help people with their burdens. And burden bearing is a command to all believers. It's not just reserved for the pastoral team or for the eldership or the people in kids ministry or the, or, or, or the you know, executive office or the or secretarial office. No, we are all called to share and to help with burdens. To be an obedient Christian, to walk in the spirit, we must help others carry their heaven burden. And that's what it means to love. That's what it means to be selfless. That's what it means to be a church. Practically, it means helping pay medical bills for someone that just can't afford it. It means babysitting for couples that are dying for a date night and don't have parents to lean on. It means helping with maintenance issues with somebody's home or car because they're not able or don't know how. It means uh, uh, buying diapers. It means, buying, it means going out on the street and giving a lot, couple of bucks to the homeless person that needs a meal right now. It means taking new meals to new parents. It means helping folks move. It means holding each other accountable, both as a spotter when you're getting that last rep up and also in sin, holding someone accountable, visiting folks in the hospital, grieving with those who grieve and rejoicing with those who rejoice. This is what we're called to do. Burden bearing is how we fulfill the law of Christ, Paul says. John chapter 13, verse 34, these are the words of Jesus. A new commandment, a new law I give to you. That you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. John Stott, theologian, in his commentary on this scripture said, It is very impressive that to love your neighbor, bear one another's burdens, and fulfill the law are three equivalent expressions. It shows that to love one another as Christ loves us may lead us not to some heroic, spectacular deed of self-sacrifice, which, by the way, Jesus did, but to the much more mundane and unspectacular ministry of burden-bearing. In other words, we should not be crushed by this command to love our neighbor and to love one another, but we should take delight in it. And realize that we do have the power to fulfill the law of Christ through the Spirit's ministry in our lives. If you're that legalist that needs rules, that needs the black and white, that needs some sort of law, there's your law right there. Love your neighbor. Love God and love your neighbor. Love your brother and sister in Christ. If you need something to follow, follow that. And he says, with the Spirit's help, we will be able to fulfill the law. Isn't that funny how he's just spent five chapters rebuking the law, the Mosaic law, and yet he says, if you want law, there's a law for you to follow, the law of Christ. So what stands in the way? Anybody? Pride. That wicked, wicked pride. Pride hinders our burden bearing. Paul, in verse 3, adds an interesting few sentences. He says, for if anyone thinks he is something... When he is nothing, he deceives himself. Man, what a verse. 
When people think that they are something, perhaps due to their stability in life, their status, their job, perhaps the amount of goodness that they've done in their life, when people begin to puff up themselves and their status in God's eyes, this is the moment where we become too good, too above to reach down and help those that are burdened and need help. Pride gets in the way. Pride often hinders, uh, hinders love. There's a story, I mentioned it this morning, I don't know if it's true or not, I checked Snopes, it's unconfirmed, but Muhammad Ali was sitting on an airplane, and it was time to take off, and the stewardess is walking down the aisle, and she tells him, hey, mister, uh, can you prepare for takeoff by putting on your seatbelt? And he looks at her, and he says, Superman don't need no seatbelt. She looks back at him without breaking a beat, she says, Superman don't need no airplane to fly. Buckle up. Listen, don't think of yourself as a spiritual superman. Don't think of yourself as someone that's got it all figured out. You've done enough. Your status, who you are, your name, your influence, it's not enough. If you think you're something, remember, you are actually nothing. Service takes humility. And here's the thing, we're going to be answerable to God for what we do. Some people chafe at this. Maybe they, don't, they reject this part of the Bible. Hey, it's in the word of God. Man, I'm just the messenger. Don't shoot me. Verse 5 says, for each will have to bear his own load. Now, this may contradict what we just read in verse 2, right? He says, bear each other's burdens. And then in verse 5, he comes back and says, well, then, but also carry your own load. And you're like, what do I do? What do you mean? And really, this doesn't contradict because these two words kind of pertain to different concepts. Verse 2, he's talking about a burden that is too heavy, right? Something that we need somebody else to help us with. We're going through some difficulty in our life. We need somebody to assist us with some sort of affliction, whether it's mental, spiritual, physical, some sort of hardship, some sort of temptation, and we need a fellow brother and sister to help us out. But verse 5 is talking about this burden as a low. Think of it as a backpack, right? Any of you that go hiking overnight perhaps, you know that you got to bring a pack, right? And you got to pack that pack with the essentials. Sleeping bag, food, you know, some sort of rain gear maybe. I don't know, a bear spray, a whistle. I don't know what else, GPS. Do people do that? And so we pack our pack, and this is what we carry. And here's the thing. When I go hiking, I'm not about to carry this other person's stuff. My stuff's, impo- my stuff's heavy enough for me, right? You figure out your own situation. I have a friend, Paul. Man, remember Paul? He'd go hi- uh, uh, camping with us. Homeboy would bring like a hot dog. Hot dog and shorts, and then you're, 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 you're in this tent. The guy doesn't have a sleeping bag. He doesn't have a pillow. He doesn't have anywhere to lay his head down. You feel sorry for the man. But it's like, yo, I brought my stuff. I'm not going to share my sleeping bag with you. <laughs> Listen, we all have our unique and special load that we carry through life. Verse 2 is about our responsibility towards others. I, I have this visual of the seals, right, when they're going through hell week. And they're just getting dragged through the mud, woken up in the middle of the night, doing flutter kicks and push-ups, right? We always feel like, ah, I could probably do that. Just need a couple months of training, hit the gym for a few months, and I'll be good. I could be a SEAL, right? It's difficult work. And one of my favorite exercises they do is the one where they have to lift a log up, right? One man can't do it. Two people can't do it. The whole squad's got to do it, right? They all got to carry this log for a time period, uh, 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 and, and they all got to do it. One or two of them begins to grow weak and drops their hands. Listen, that log's log's coming down. They're not going to complete their mission. It requires all of them to carry that weight. Versus their pack, their rifle, right? This is my rifle. It is special. It is my own, uh, right? The the, the MREs in their backpack, their their, their gear, it's their own. It's what they answer for and are required to keep. Some things in life are so heavy, we cannot bear them alone. And so we reach out and we ask for help. Other matters in life are simply a backpack. Everything in your life is not always a crisis. Like we don't need to call 911 or the National Guard for every little boo-boo in our life. We don't need to convene a meeting for every misunderstanding or uncomfortable moment in, uh, in life. We're also given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit reveals uh, 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 to us different ways. We, we, we have prayer. We have trust in God. We can do it on our own sometimes. And here's the other part, Liz. You have a mission that I don't have. You have gifts and abilities that I don't have. You have opportunity that I don't have. And vice versa. 
That's how it works. The Bible tells us that we all have our unique callings. We all have our unique duties in the kingdom of God. We are all created specially and uniquely and given those unique abilities and talents and callings in our life to edify and build up the church and to spread the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. And if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you've been gifted and you've been called and you're to be a witness. And we each have that individual mission in where we are in life today. And we will give an account, Paul says, for how we carried out that mission. God in the day, in that day won't ask us how we did in comparison to other people, right? He won't, he won't compare Paul uh, uh, to Peter. He won't compare you to me. No, we are going to be judged on our own merits, the Bible says. Romans 14, 12, Paul says, so then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Now, he's not going to boot you out of heaven, but there will be an account that you must answer for. Were you obedient to God? Did you serve others? Did you fulfill the calling in your life? Were you sensitive to the Spirit? So not only do we have a responsibility to look outward to help others, but uh, with our burden, but we also have to look inwardly and make sure we are obeying God in what he has called each and every one to do in their unique and special way and circumstance. Verse 6, Paul shifts gears a little bit. He says, let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Passages like these are very, very important to speak on. But they're not necessarily fun. Like they can be a little awkward for the preacher to talk about this. Uh, Martin Luther once wrote, these passages are all meant to benefit us as ministers. I must say, I do not find much pleasure in explaining these verses. I am made to appear as if I'm speaking for my own benefit. This is a basic, though sometimes very neglected spiritual principle. Those who feed and bless you spiritually should be supported by you financially. Paul repeated this principle many times. This isn't the first time he brings up this concept, although Galatians was an early letter he wrote. So perhaps this is the first time we see this concept being uh, 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 kind of proclaimed. But over and over, 1 Corinthians 9, 11, he says, If we have uh, sown spiritual things amongst you, is it too much if we reap material things from you? Uh, 14 in that same chapter says, In the same way the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Understand this, and, and I feel like I'm uh, in a unique circumstance where I can speak on this because I'm not on staff, but I get to preach and teach, and it is a huge blessing for me in life, so, so I, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm a perfect person to speak on this. Nobody gets in the preaching game for the money. <laughs> Nobody gets into the pastoral, you know, occupation, if you want to put it that way, for the money. It's, 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 it's not a job. It's a calling. God calls you into that ministry. So you don't get into it for the money. There are those that abuse this role. They abuse it. They live lavish lifestyles. They, they shun and ignore their responsibility to the congregation and to, and, and to their flock. But speaking as one of the pastor teachers here at Anthem Church, understand that the responsibility of a teacher, of a pastor, is a heavy one. The role of the pastor teacher is not to entertain. It's not to use gimmicks to attract people to some sort of performance. We are called to teach and preach the truth of Scripture. Why? 2 Timothy 4.2 tells us we are commanded to do so. It is what we have to do. It's also because the Word of God is what we need. We need the Bible. We need to understand the Word of God. We need someone to spend time in prayer, in, 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 in the presence of the Holy Spirit, working the, their way through what God has spoken to us and to share that news, to share that message. We need faithful and effective Bible teachers. Now, it's not shunning any other parts of the church or any other works of the church. We should have a mercy ministry. We should take care of the orphans and the widows and the downcast. We should take care of the poor in spirit. That is a calling for the church. But listen, one of the pillars of what a church does is we proclaim and teach the gospel, the good news, the word of God. 
Paul urges his believers to provide for those teachers materially. This may include finances, food. It may include uh, whatever good things are appropriate for that teacher's welfare. And Paul actually provided for himself. He was a tent maker, sometimes to keep from burdening the church. But sometimes we see he did take support. He, you can read it in Philippians. You can read 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He thought it was good for the church to support ministers. 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 17, 18. 1 Corinthians 9, as we've read. And why do you think Paul included this instruction here? Probably because the teachers in Galatia needed help. Like Paul and Barnabas came through, they preached the word, people believed, they said yes, yes, yes. Paul, and, uh, 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 Paul placed pastors and leaders and teachers in that area to lead the church. And after he left and after some of these Galatians were fooled, were bamboozled by these Judaizers, perhaps these pastors, teachers were in a rough spot. They were called to serve God, to preach the word, and yet they couldn't take care of themselves financially. They couldn't provide for themselves. But here's the thing. Don't miss Paul's ultimate concern here. It's not about money. Again, you don't get into the game for the money. Paul's burden was for furthering the gospel, and he knew that the means for accomplishing this was the steady proclaiming of the word of God by faithful teachers. But these teachers would be limited if they would not be taken care of uh, 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 for their daily necessities. And so as a church, by caring for the needs of the teacher, what the church says is we want the word of God to be taught faithfully and correctly and effectively so we will support you. So you don't have to worry about working a full-time job and taking care of your family, which is, by the way, a requirement for a pastor to not uh, discard his family, to spend time with his kids, to spend time with his wife, to make sure his household is in check. We must care for those who teach, not because it's merely tradition or because we have to, but because we want to see the word of God being spread, being preached because we love the Word of God. Allow me to take a little subjective slant here. I believe Anthem Church should not have ministers that worry about their next check, how they're going to make their mortgage payment. I believe uh, the people that serve in our executive uh, uh, section, in our, uh, in, in our, in our uh, um, secretarial uh, uh, divi uh, department, our kids' ministry, I believe that those, those, they should not be worried about whether they're, they can go to the ER, whether it's going to be too expensive or not because they have no health care. I believe that a minister should not be worrying that when I'm 60, will my kids take me in and take care of me because I have no retirement fund or, or anything to look forward to. I, I don't believe that uh, our ministers should worry and should have the decision of, can I have another baby or do I continue to work in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the place that I'm working in the church? I believe we need to provide for those that labor and work to spread the good news of Jesus Christ. So that's the money talk. Let's move on. Verse 7, do not be deceived, he says, God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that he will also reap. He goes on, for the one who sows to his flesh will from the flesh reap from corruption, but those who sows to the spirit will reap, uh, from the spirit reap eternal life. Uh, Paul has a different emphasis here in these verses. He's not talking about money. He's talking about personal holiness. And, and, and this is a divine law. We said this is God's way. You reap what you sow. If you sow in the spirit, you will reap the spirit. If you sow in the flesh, you will reap the flesh. Chapter 5, verses 16 through 25, you can read it. To sow to the flesh is to pander to it, it's to give in to it, it's to coddle it instead of crucifying it. The Bible says daily. And so the old adage by Waldo Emerson, who was a poet and abolitionist in the 1920s, he said, sow a thought, reap an act. Sow an act, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character, reap a destiny. He was spot on with these words. See, seeds are mainly thoughts and deeds. And every time we allow our mind to hold a grudge, to, to, to have a grievance against someone, to harbor bitterness in our life against someone, to allow anger to manifest and take hold of our heart, 
When we entertain an impure fantasy, when we wallow in self-pity, we are sowing to the flesh. We are sowing seeds of the flesh. And some people sow to the flesh every single day, and then they wonder why they don't reap holiness and victory and blessing and freedom. John Stott, again, theologian, commentates on this, and he says, holiness is a harvest. Whether we reap it or not depends almost entirely on what we sow. Paul adds a warning. He says, God is not mocked. You can't trick God. You can't thumb your nose at God. Regardless of who you are, you reap what you sow. Paul says in 2 Corinthians eleven fifteen, 15, their end will correspond to their deeds. If a farmer plants wheat, he cannot expect for there to be corn that grows. If you don't plant anything, you can't expect something to magically pop up, unless you like weeds. And in contrast, those who have been born of the Spirit, verse 8 tells us, sow in the Spirit and will reap eternal life. So how does this relate to us in our biblical community, our church? It's very simple. Paul says it's one who is spiritual, led by the Holy Spirit, that does the restoring. So what keeps us from restoring? What keeps us from, <clears throat> excuse me, bearing each other's burdens? It's pride. And where does that come from? From sowing to the flesh. What keeps us from being generous and supporting our ministers? It's greed. Where does greed come from? It comes from sowing to the flesh. In verse 10, he says we must do good to the household of faith. What keeps us from doing to good to the household of faith? Selfishness. Sowing to the flesh. You see, our lack of personal holiness does not only damage ourselves, but it damages each and every one of us here. We're not a fully functioning part of the church body when, when, we, when we are not pursuing God, when we are not sowing to the Spirit. I want to conclude with these words. We're almost done. It's interesting that oftentimes when we decide that we want to reap from the Spirit the good things of God, we begin to plant our meager seeds, right? We begin to sow our seeds, right? Perhaps you were in sin, someone came and restored you gently, kind of put you in line, right? Reset that bone, that joint. And now you're like, yo, I, I, I want to live the good life. I want, I want to get right with God. I want to be blessed by God. I want to be holy like God. So I'm going to start sowing my seeds of, of the Spirit. Perhaps you've hit rock bottom and you've made all these promises that you're going to be different. You're going to start sowing seeds of the Spirit. And so you try to give up your bad habits. You get on a different track in life, right? You start doing good. And then the next day you wake up and you wonder why everything isn't different. Why does, why does strife and why does physical illness and financial crisis still exist? Why does the sin keep tempting me even though I promised that I wouldn't and I'm sowing my seed and yet it still exists. It's still pulling me back in, tripping me up. It's because we've just started sowing the seeds of the Spirit. You see, you have to give it a while for that crop to come up. You have to be patient. My son has been very interested in planting things, seeds, the concept of seeds and how they grow. It's just blow, mind blown, right? And so he asked us to plant some seeds this spring, and so we went and bought that little box from Home Depot and planted some seeds in there. And every morning he'd wake up and he'd run downstairs 6.30 in the morning looking for that growth, waiting for that seed to produce. And he'd come and he'd wake his dad up and be like, Dad, it's not doing anything. Where's it at? Where's my plum tree? Where's my cilantro? Where's my tomatoes? He wants it now. He's expecting it to happen now. And yet, that's not how it works. When we plant, we must be patient. Paul says this in verse 9. Let us not grow weary of doing good. For in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. The New King James Version says it. Lose heart. And so what Paul's saying, don't give up. Don't stop spreading the seeds of the Spirit. Continue living that life. Continue pursuing God. Don't lose heart in what you're doing as you try to live by the Spirit. If you don't see immediate result, if you don't see a quick payoff, don't give up. Keep going. That's not to say that God won't do miraculous things in your life, but also it takes time sometimes. 
There's this uh, uh, referring to the phrase lose heart or don't give up. Uh, in the ancient world, this was used to describe the kind of fear and weariness a woman experiences during labor, but before delivery. It describes a time when the work is hard and painful, but also unfinished and unrewarded. And no amount of ice chips are going to help. No amount of, uh, 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 you know, encouragement from your husband or your, your, your spouse is going to help. You want them to shut up, get in the corner, look away, don't breathe, don't look at me while I'm going through this very laborious and painful process. And oftentimes in our life when we go through this difficult time and we don't see the end and it's so hard right now, Paul says don't give up. Be patient. It's going to come. The baby will come, the pain will go away, the harvest will be ready. He says, keep going. Verse 10, so then as we have opportunity, let, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are the household of faith. Church, we have to seek to do good with our resources that God has blessed us with and called us stewards of, whether it's finances, whether it's time, talents, or simply a truck, we must do good. And who do we do good to? We do good to everybody. Everybody we come across, we should try and strive to do good. But then he says, but especially to those who are God's family. See, it's not that we neglect or ignore the needs of those outside of the family. For sure we help them. We have a benevolent uh, uh, fund, right? We, we do outreaches. But let us not forget the fellowship of believers. Let us not forget our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. It's easy to forget those that are closest to you. It's easy to forget that they are there when someone new and shiny comes along. We roll out the carpet for our guests. We roll out the carpet for the one that is new. But oftentimes we forget to those that are family. He says, those of you who are the household of faith, especially those of you who are a household of faith. What ties us all together? We're going to land this plane now. It's faith. You see, Paul could have called it the household of love very 70-ish like. He could have called it the house of worship. That would have sounded pretty cool. But he calls it the household of faith. And it's because it's faith and faith alone that unites us. It's faith and faith alone that saves us. It's faith and faith alone that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ. Our faith in Jesus Christ. Not an intellectual knowledge of Jesus, but our faith. And we can be part of that household of faith, as he puts it, when we put our trust in Jesus and rely on him to save us. When we become family, it's not just, you know, another, another notch on our belt or another affiliation that we have. It is our identity. It's interesting, my boy came to us with some chores the other day that he wanted to complete, and it was an amazing thing to see. He wanted, he willingly came to me with chores, stacking laundry, washing the windows. It was, it was a grace of God a moment. But listen here, if he didn't complete his chore list, if he didn't do the chores correctly, is he not part of the family anymore? Yes, he is. But, but because he loves my wife and I, his sister, and because he wants to contribute in our family, he willingly wanted to do something, even something small, to be a member of the family. You see, today's topic, today's theme has been about doing good. And if I was to put it this way, and please don't hold it against me, if we are looking for a church as believers, as brothers and sisters of Christ, as those that are in the family, the household of faith, our chore is to do good. If you mess up, if you fall, if you get caught up in sin, you're not out of the family. You're not banished. We will restore you gently and with love. But if you want a law to live by, do good. Love your neighbor. Love God. And he will bless us. Church, let's stand for prayer. God, we thank you. We thank you, Lord, for your grace. We thank you, God, for your mercy and your love. God, we thank you for the Holy Spirit that lives in us, Lord, that compels us and leads us. And, and God, it, 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 he convicts us. And, and Holy Spirit, I pray, Lord, as we, as we move forward in our life, Holy Spirit, I pray that, that you help us carry people's burdens. 
that you grow the fruit of gentleness and love in us. That we don't grow weary in doing good, that we share all that is good with those that minister and teach us. God, I thank you. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for me. I thank you, God, that through my faith and faith alone, you forgive me and give me life. Lord, I pray that Anthem Church is not a dead church. It's not a selfish church. But it is a church that loves not only you, but our neighbors and even our enemies. Thank you, God. Amen.
God always calls, also calls us to bear each other's burdens. Uh, before you guys leave, real quick, if, you're, uh, if you came to our ABC, uh, our courses, our membership courses last week, our, uh, we're going to meet again at 5.30 here in the building. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys all there. And lastly, this Wednesday, uh, we can uh, share and carry each other's burdens in prayer. Uh, so we're going to meet here at 7.30 in this building on Wednesday. Looking forward to seeing you guys there. We're going to pray uh, uh, communally and worship God as a church body. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.